chosen tarnished and would-be lord, descend into the depths far below the Erdtree capital, seek audience with the three fingers and the flame of frenzy. If you inherit the flame of frenzy, your flesh will serve as kindling, and the girl can be spared, setting you on the righteous path of lordship, the path of the lord of chaos. Burn the earth tree to the ground and incinerate all that divides and distinguishes. Ah, oh, may chaos take the world. May chaos take the world. So says Shabriri the Slanderer. One of the three main endings of Elden Ring is the Lord of Frenzied Flame. This is something I've discussed on my channel a few times, in my endings video and in relation to a discussion on the Primordial Crucible. And while I unquestionably view it as the worst ending in the context of the in-game world, it is one of the philosophically richest and most interesting endings. For a quick recap, this ending has the player become the Lord of Chaos and end the world by melting everything away with the Flame of Frenzy, also called the Yellow Chaos Flame. The Three Fingers and their patron outer god, the Frenzied Flame, see individuated life as a curse, believing that the suffering of subjective experience is so terrible that life simply isn't worth living. Originally, life was one big blob, some kind of continuous being in the One Great or the Primordial Crucible, and the Frenzied Flame would have us go back to that kind of singularity, where individual experience is impossible. We learn more about this reasoning from Hayata's dialogue. All that there is came from the one great, then came fractures, and births, and souls. But the greater will made a mistake. Torment, despair, affliction, every sin, every curse, every one born of the mistake. And so, what was borrowed must be returned, melted all away with the yellow chaos flame, until all is one again. Those who gave me grapes howled without words, saying they wished they were never born. Become their lord, take their torment, despair, their affliction, every sin, every curse, and melt it all away. As the lord of chaos, no more fractures. No more birth. This view of complete denial of life can be roughly categorized as a kind of nihilism, a rejection of meaning, or more accurately as pessimism or antinatalism, consisting in the belief that life is not worth living or continuing due to its unjustified suffering and pain. Another lore YouTuber, Radatosker, actually has a really good video on the Frenzied Flame and this view, where he does a great job of not only making the lore understandable, but also in relaying the feeling of the pessimistic viewpoint. He does this by reading a selection of timeless Russian literature by the author Fyodor Dostoevsky. He also has another video going through a lot of the specifics of the actual in-game lore, so I figured I can leave that be for now. In this video, I want to follow Radatosker's lead and try to relate a certain feeling, and some arguments, that revolve around the Flame of Frenzy and its ending. But instead of capturing the viewpoint of the Frenzied Flame, I want to present the other side of things. The view that the end of all life as we know it is actually a bad thing. To do this, I will look at what Melina has to say on the matter, and I will be reading some literature of my own, from an author who has also read and appreciated Dostoevsky. Someone who was upfront about the suffering and cruelty of life, but nonetheless concluded that our only worthwhile option is to affirm and say yes to life. I'm going to be reading excerpts from the 19th century author and philosopher, Frederick Nietzsche. In the first book he ever published, The Birth of Tragedy, Nietzsche shows us that he understands the view of the frenzied flame. He does this by recalling a folk story of the ancient Greeks, a story whose dialogue would be eerily at home in Elden Ring coming out of the mouth of the Three Fingers, or Hayata rather. He says, There is an ancient story that King Midas hunted in the forest a long time for the wise Silenus, the companion of Dionysus, without capturing him. 
When Silenus at last fell into his hands, the king asked what was the best and most desirable of all things for man. Fixed and immovable, the demigod said not a word, till at last, urged by the king, he gave a shrill laugh and broke out into these words. O oh, wretched ephemeral race, children of chance and misery, why do you compel me to tell you what it would be most expedient for you not to hear? What is best of all is utterly beyond your reach, not to be born, not to be, to be nothing. But the second best for you is this, to die soon. The words of Silenus are essentially the same as we hear from the Frenzied Flame, a doctrine against life going back over 2,000 years. Nietzsche continues discussing the Greeks and their myths, especially of the gods Apollo and Dionysus. In more text that bears near identity to what we hear in game, Nietzsche considers that the properly Dionysian suffering is like a transformation into air, water, earth, and fire, and that we are therefore to regard the state of individuation as the origin and primal cause of all suffering, as something objectionable in itself. The individuation that the frenzied flame lamented is precisely the topic here. It sounds like FromSoft or Miyazaki might have read some Nietzsche. He continues, This view of things already provides us with all the elements of a profound and pessimistic view of the world, together with the mystery doctrine of tragedy, the fundamental knowledge of the oneness of everything existent the conception of individuation as the primal cause of evil, and of art as the joyous hope that the spell of individuation may be broken in augury of a restored oneness. Nietzsche saw certain kinds of art, such as the tragic plays of the ancient Greeks, as being able to bring about a feeling of oneness which transcends the pains of life. The flame of frenzy desires to return to the oneness of the primordial crucible, and in order to do this, it desires an end of individuated life. But Nietzsche says that art and aesthetic experience have the power to bring about that feeling in life, eliminating the need for our collective annihilation. The metaphysical comfort, with which I am suggesting even now every true tragedy leaves us, that life is at the bottom of things, despite all the changes of appearances, indestructibly powerful and pleasurable. This comfort appears in incarnate clarity in the chorus of the satyrs. The satyrs are an aspect of Greek myth and a core part of tragic Greek plays. A chorus of natural beings who live ineradicably, as it were, behind all civilization and remain eternally the same, despite the changes of generations and of the history of nations. With this chorus, the deep-minded Hellene, or Greek, who is so singularly qualified for the most delicate and severe suffering, consoles himself. He who has glanced with piercing eye into the very heart of the terrible, destructive processes of so-called universal history, as also into the cruelty of nature, and is in danger of longing for a Buddhistic negation of the will. Art saves him, and through art, life saves him, or herself. Nietzsche concludes this section and point by referencing Shakespeare's Hamlet, who at the pinnacle of his own tragedy contemplated suicide and the value of life, in the now infamous phrase, to be or not to be, that is the question. To this question of suicide, Nietzsche writes, True knowledge and insight into the horrible truth outweighs any motive for action, both in Hamlet and in the Dionysian man. No comfort avails anymore. Longing transcends a world after death, even the gods. Existence is negated, along with its glittering reflection in the gods or in an immortal beyond. Conscious of the truth he has once seen, Man now sees everywhere only the horror or absurdity of existence. Now he understands what is symbolic in Ophelia's fate. Now he understands the wisdom of the sylvan god Silenus. He is nauseated. Here, when the danger to his will is greatest, art approaches as a saving sorceress, expert at healing. She alone knows how to turn these nauseous thoughts about the horror or absurdity of existence into notions with which one can live. These are the sublime as the artistic taming of the horrible, and the comic as the artistic discharge of the nausea of absurdity. When we are frozen in action or in life by the terrors of existence of the world, the unjustified cruelty and suffering, it is art that can take this and turn it into something with which we can live. It is art which can give us the feeling the frenzied flame desires without annihilating the world. And beyond the saving graces of art, Nietzsche had plenty more to say to the question of the worthiness of life and the feasibility of total annihilation as suffering's solution. 
We have been reading from The Birth of Tragedy, which as I said is Nietzsche's first work. We can see another approach to an answer in one of his final published works, Twilight of the Idols. Here Nietzsche takes direct aim at those who would deny life, and how they themselves are unjustified in their claims of life's lack of justification. He writes, Once one has comprehended the outrage of such a revolt against life, as has become almost sacrosanct in Christian morality, one has, fortunately, also comprehended something else. The futility, apparentness, absurdity, and mendaciousness of such a revolt. A condemnation of life by the living remains in the end a mere symptom of a certain kind of life. The question whether it is justified or unjustified is not even raised thereby. One would require a position outside of life and yet have to know it as well as one, as many, as all who have lived it, in order to be permitted even to touch the problem of the value of life. Reasons enough to comprehend that this problem is for us an unapproachable problem. When we speak of values, we speak with the inspiration, with the way of looking at things, which is part of life. Life itself forces us to posit values. Life itself values through us when we posit values. Now, maybe the frenzied flame, being some sort of godlike being that we do not have a clear picture of, is in more of a place to speak on the merits of life under the one great, of unindividuated life, where all are one and no one exists independently. But at that, we would have to take its word, its word transferred first through the three fingers and then through Hayata. We ourselves have no standing to see or claim that life in the frenzied flame ending would be more valuable than life as it is or could be. We have no standing to talk about the value of that which is outside of life. For we are in life, and only through life can we value things, can we claim value or lack of value. So to do so about something outside of life would be unjustified. Though in terms of this standing, there is one more we hear from on the matter. One who has suffered, burned, and seemingly even died before. So they, like the frenzied flame, might have standing to discuss the value of this ending. This is one who has been tormented and likely despaired, but who nevertheless continues to affirm. At the grace near the three fingers, at the bottom of the merchant's tomb, Melina speaks to us. She defends life, in the same ways we hear from Nietzsche, first by affirming it, and then by pointing out how its lack is categorically impossible to be valued. She says, If you intend to claim the frenzied flame, I ask that you cease. It is not to be meddled with. It is chaos, devouring life and thought unending. However ruined this world has become, however mired in torment and despair, life endures. Births continue. There is beauty in that. Is there not? If you would become Lord, do not deny this notion. Please, leave the frenzied flame alone. I ask you one more time. Please, seek not the frenzied flame. As one who strives to become a Lord, deny not the lives the new births of this world. Those who would are not fit to be called Lord when the land they preside over is lifeless. Please, put a stop to this madness. The Lord of Frenzied Flame is no Lord at all when the land they preside over is lifeless. I want to end this video with one more piece of Nietzsche's writings, the most literary and full of feeling of today's selection. It comes from Thus Spoke Zarathustra, Nietzsche's masterpiece and most literary work, a narrative he developed to showcase some of his most pressing thoughts. In this section, the main character, Zarathustra, has just tried to speak to a crowd about the need for a new valuation of life after the death of religion and its dogma, which is something Nietzsche saw in his own time and predicted about the future, that with the decline of religion, we're going to need a new way to view, understand, and value in life and in the world. The crowd Zarathustra speaks to does not understand him, so they mock him. In this piece, Nietzsche expressed his dismay at a potential kind of future person, who, after the end of the reign of religion, seeks the end of suffering, a life of complete peace, idleness, and niceness. To me, I read this as a weaker form of the followers of the frenzied flame. 
kind of like a real-world analog, motivated by the same ideas, but unable to enact the same end goal of worldwide genocide due to obvious practical limitations. Here Nietzsche writes, When Zarathustra had spoken these words, he beheld the people again and was silent. There they stand, he said to his heart. There they laugh. They do not understand me. I am not the mouth for these ears. Must one smash their ears before they learn to listen with their eyes? Must one clatter like kettle drums and preachers of repentance? Or do they believe only the stammerer? They have something of which they are proud. What do they call that which makes them proud? Education, they call it. It distinguishes them from goat herds. That is why they do not like to hear the word contempt applied to them. Let me then address their pride. Let me speak to them of what is most contemptible. But that is the last man. In the German, Nietzsche uses the word mensch, which, even though it sounds like man, I think translates better to human being or human, just it's a very general word, so I'm going to be using the last human beings or the last human. And thus spoke Zarathustra to the people. The time has come for man to set himself a goal. The time has come for mankind to plant the seed of their highest hope. Their soil is still rich enough, but one day this soil will be poor and domesticated, and no tall tree will be able to grow in it. Alas, the time is coming when human beings will no longer shoot the arrow of their longing beyond human beings, and the string of their bow will have forgotten how to whir. I say unto you, one must still have chaos in oneself to be able to give birth to a dancing star. I say unto you, you still have chaos in yourselves. Alas, the time is coming when mankind will no longer give birth to a star. Alas, the time of the most despicable human is coming, one that is no longer able to despise himself. Behold, I show you the last human being. What is love? What is creation? What is longing? What is a star? Thus asks the last human being, and they blink. The earth has become small, and on it hops the last human being, who makes everything small. Their race is as ineradicable as the flea beetle. The last human being lives longest. We have invented happiness, say the last human beings, and they blink. They have left the regions where it was hard to live, for one needs warmth. One still loves one's neighbor and rubs against him, for one needs warmth. Becoming sick and harboring suspicion are sinful to them. One proceeds carefully. A fool, whoever still stumbles over stones or human beings. A little poison now and then, that makes for agreeable dreams. And much poison in the end, for an agreeable death. One still works, for work is a form of entertainment. But one is careful lest the entertainment be too harrowing. One no longer becomes poor or rich, both require too much exertion. Who still wants to rule, who obey, both require too much exertion. No shepherd and one herd, everybody wants the same, everybody is the same. Whoever feels different goes voluntarily into a madhouse. Formerly, all the world was mad, say the most refined, and they blink. One is clever and knows everything that has ever happened, so there is no end of derision. One still quarrels, but one is soon reconciled, else it might spoil the digestion. One has one's little pleasure for the day and one's little pleasure for the night, but one has a regard for health. We have invented happiness, say the last mention and they blink.